The Violence Against Women Act is a well-intended legislation with extreme negative consequences. Research shows that men and women were equally likely to engage in domestic violence, but the Violence Against Women Act law ignored female-on-male violence, and this has caused men to be unjustly stereotyped as abusers. It's also caused a weakening of the family and an expansion of the power of the state. History will reveal the Violence Against Women Act to be a significant violation of the Constitution. Consider this. First, the First Amendment, freedom of speech. Civil law definitions of domestic violence include things like annoyance, emotional distress, and harassment. Such psychological states are typically caused by speech that's protected under the Constitution but perceived by a partner as offensive. Second, the Second Amendment. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The Domestic Violence Offender Gun Ban of 1996, often referred to as the Lautenberg Amendment, banned the ownership of guns by individuals who are under a final restraining order for domestic violence. Although this might seem like a reasonable safeguard to protect an abused intimate partner, it can easily result in overreach against an individual who needs to carry a gun to maintain his employment. Third, the Fourth Amendment. Citizens must be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects. The Violence Against Women Act promotes the issuance of non-contact orders that typically force a person to leave the house within an hour. Such orders are issued ex parte, meaning the expelled person, usually the man, is given no opportunity to tell his side of the story. Fourth, the Fourth Amendment again. There must exist probable cause before a person can be seized. From the beginning, Violence Against Women Act has promoted mandatory arrest policies. Mandatory arrest is a clear violation of the plain meaning of probable cause. Fifth, the Fourteenth Amendment. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. In most states, civil law definitions of domestic violence are overly broad, to the point that it's difficult, if not impossible, to disprove an allegation of abuse. Violence Against Women Act funds the training of prosecutors and judges. Such training programs have been shown to present one-sided information, thus biasing the criminal justice system against male defendants. Sixth, the 14th Amendment. No state shall make or enforce any law which denies to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Despite men being more likely than women to be the victim of domestic violence, four out of five persons arrested for domestic violence are men, according to the Department of Justice. A report issued by the Coalition to End Domestic Violence estimates that each year, two million persons experience violations of their constitutional rights as a result of Violence Against Women Act-driven policies. Robert Franklin sums up the civil rights debacle this way. For many years, feminists lied about the facts of domestic violence in order to tar men as the sole abusers of women and demand radical changes in the law and police practice. Governments, seeing an opportunity to expand their power, readily agreed. Individual women soon came to understand their ability to recruit state power against their male partners. Due process of law went out the window as police were trained that, in any case of alleged domestic violence, it was the male who was at fault. He could be removed from his home, children and belongings, and placed under a court order solely on the say-so of his wife and girlfriend. Domestic violence restraining orders routinely violated the most obvious constitutional strictures. Once the Constitution is jettisoned for the chivalrous cause of protecting women, the proverbial slippery slope becomes a precipitous cliff. Second, the bill promotes the concept of victim-centered, trauma-informed investigations. In practice, victim-centered means accord greater credibility to the complainant rather than the accused and trauma-informed means interpret any inconsistencies in a person's testimony as proof of the enormous trauma she has putatively suffered. Simply make a false accusation and you get the house, the kids, and years of child support, 
no impartial investigations or messy court hearings necessary. Dr. Warren Farrell summarized the problems with ignoring female-on-male violence this way. A violence against men as women's liberation, Thelma and Louise, was widely touted as a film of women's liberation. It was, for example, the only film celebrated by the National Organization for Women at its 25th convention. Never in American history have two men been celebrated as heroes of men's liberation after they deserted their wives, met one female jerk after another, and then killed one woman and left another woman stuffed in a trunk in 120 degree desert heat. Male serial killers are condemned, not celebrated at men's liberation conventions. The moment a men's movement calls it a sign of empowerment or brotherhood when men kill women is the moment I will protest it as fascism. Dr. Warren Farrell in The Myth of Male Power. The current form of the Violence Against Women's Act causes all too frequent violations of constitutional rights of men. In helping to solve one problem, it creates another. A law which facilitates constitutional rights violation should also contain penalties for false allegations and abusive process. The name of the Violence Against Women Act should be changed to the Intimate Partner Violence Reduction Act and all wording be revised to be sex neutral. Adapted from an article written by the Coalition to End Domestic Violence and produced by the Law Center. Click the link in the description portion of this video to learn more about them.